Thank you. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you for the organizers for uh, having me here today. It's a, a pleasure to be here and to talk to you about this subject. Uh, if, if you have heard about this or if you haven't heard about this stuff before, uh, I, I hope that you mark down today as a significant day in your life because uh, just in the same time, I don't know if you can remember the first time you heard about the internet, uh, this is that sort of level of impact that this is going to have on the world. Now, um, obviously, you know, human beings have this universal thing when it comes to new technology. When it comes to upgrades and new features, that's cool. But as soon as there's something new that comes along, you know, we have this universal, uh, 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 you know, we, we think about it in the same sort of way. It's always fear, skepticism, and doubt, okay? And uh, what happens is that the technology becomes mainstream, and then eventually we can't live without it. And the internet is a perfect example. But so were cars, so were telephones, so were radios. When those were invented, people were doubtful, and they were skepti skeptical, and they thought it was going to be the downfall of humanity, and look at us today. So please have an open mind. Uh, and uh, I want to, uh, to make sure that uh, not only are you going to hear about something cool today, but you're going to learn something. You know, learn uh, a, a, new, a new skill, let's say. Something that you can perhaps add to your LinkedIn profiles and get promotions with later on. <laughs> All right. So I want to try and squeeze in as much information as I can into this 30 minutes, uh, because I'm going to build up what this thing is. And then I'm going to show you some very, very interesting applications of it and how it changes the world, especially when it comes to smart grids and comes to monetization. This is all about money. How do we, get, how do we uh, use money more efficiently? How do we uh, get people to pay for things? And I'm going to now uh, give you that whole uh, story of that. Now, I, I am a software engineer by trade, uh, but I do have a background in the energy industry. For many years, I spent uh, time building ma uh, management systems, analytics, uh, vending systems for smart grids. And uh, this is now uh, where uh, I was involved when I got involved with this kind of technology. And I realized that it has enormous implications for smart grids and energy distribution and, and uh, the cost recovery when it comes to uh, you know, actually getting your money out uh, once you've supplied the utility. So I'm going to uh, give you the whole story of that, and then I'm going to show you some more interesting applications around the world when it comes to these things like microgrids and monetization, because you're going to see that there, at the moment there's a fundamental flaw, and that fundamental flaw is within the financial system itself, not necessarily with the distribution and all that sort of thing, and the utilities, not so. When it comes to uh, monetization, uh, the financial system itself is a roadblock, and uh, you're going to see how money now has become something else. You know, uh, we're going to realize, and if you, the more you go back into this, and I don't want to talk too much about money, what makes money money, but you're going to realize that throughout history, money has been all sorts of things. You know, shells and, and pepper and the sticks and whatever. Uh, and we realize that money isn't so much what it is, but more a case of what it does. And uh, uh, as it was referred to, once upon a time, you know, our money was gold. And we, uh, in the 19, 1971, the world went off the gold standard. And since that time, we've been in this big monetary experiment where we have what's called a fiat-based money system. Fiat means by law. So the law has told us that these pieces of paper and these numbers in our bank accounts are money. And they're legal tender. You have to pay your taxes in it, with it. That means you have to now start earning it. Uh, uh, and so this is a monetary experiment that's been going on for just over 45 years. And we can see how around the world how the experiment itself is starting to fail. And uh, Zimbabwe was a clear case and example, but Zimbabwe isn't the only one. We have now, now have Venezuela, and many countries throughout the world are experiencing asset, uh, 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 co uh, cost price inflation. But uh, you'll be surprised to know if you go back and look that uh, the whole world is going through hyperinflation right now, and it all started in 2008. So let me now uh, embark on this whole thing. I want you to reserve judgment about this technology being money and what makes money money. I'm now going to give you the use case for it. And uh, uh, first of all, what it is, and then how it's going to affect your own lives and your own industry, and outside of your industry in the, in the years to come. Okay, I hope that's a, a, a bold enough uh, introduction to get you excited. All right, and stimulated at this late hour. Okay, so, uh, you know, the internet's an amazing thing. Uh, we all love the internet. We all can't live without the internet. Uh, but, you know, there's always been this problem with the internet, and it comes down to payments. Uh, I'm sure all of you remember with delight the first time you had to put your credit card into the internet. I'm sure you were very happy about that, handing over all your sensitive information. But the, inter the credit card was never meant for the internet. It was always meant to be something that you carry on you and that you present to the merchant or whatever. And we have no other choice when it comes to making payments online. We have to use credit cards. And what happens is we have to go and hand over our sensitive information to the merchant. And there's a lot of trust involved. 
We have to trust that the merchant isn't going to take that money and, and uh, walk off with it or take more than they owed. But the merchant also has to trust because they have to trust that we are in fact the owner of that credit card and there's a whole lot of fees and a lot of fraud that goes on when it comes to making payments online with credit cards and that's just because the technology uh, of credit cards wasn't meant for the internet. And you know, uh, back in 2000, uh, you know, there's a very famous uh, Nobel Prize winning economist called Milton Friedman. He said that what uh, does not exist yet, but that will soon be developed as a reliable e-cash. Because he could see how the internet was cool, but money, the internet money that we had then, the credit card, just wasn't cutting it. Uh, and so since that time, there have been many uh, researchers and developers and economists all trying to figure out how to create digital cash. And I'm now going to explain to you the difference between the cash that we use in our pockets and the internet money that we use, the, the digital money that we use when it comes to credit cards and debit cards and EFTs. You're going to see that those aren't digital cash. Your credit card is not cash. So what makes something cash? You know, if I go to a retailer and I hand over 50 rand, the retailer doesn't care who I am. They don't need to trust that I am who I say I am. Uh, they just know that that token that they're receiving, that little piece of paper that they're receiving, if they check the security on that, the watermark and so on, then that's fine. The security is wrapped up into that little piece of paper. Same thing with me, if I hand over that money, you know, I don't have to care who the merchant is as long as I get my, my goods. All right, so can you see how in a cash transaction, the trust is not between the two participants. The trust is between, within the actual token that is being transferred. And uh, uh, that's why the internet fails, because when you make a payment online or you make a digital payment with your credit card, there's no cash token that you're handing over. There's a whole lot of trust wound up into that. So this is just a quick experiment. And as I, I'm not experiment, an explanation. And uh, as I said to you, I want to teach you something today. And then I'm going to show you something as well. So you're going to have to go through these little learning slides with me. So please bear with me. So let's say now I want to go and uh, make a payment online. Well, what happens is I can now go to the merchant and uh, I now whip out my credit card, but money doesn't flow from my credit card into the merchant's, uh, merchant's little money repository. I have to send a notification to the bank to remove money and take money out of my bank account and to go and credit the bank account of the merchant. Okay, that's how a digital payment works today. So this is now why we have this big issue with uh, uh, high costs of, of transactions uh, uh, and so on. And a lot, of, uh, the, a lot of the fraud and the risk that's involved with those transactions. So as I said to you before, for 20 years now people have been trying to figure this out. How to get away from the system and how to get into a, a, a digital cash system. Now in October 2015, this article came out in The Economist magazine and it said in the article that this is the most important invention since the internet. And it talked about this technology that could remove the intermediary, remove trust from transactions, and it talked about this new form of money. Now again, if you want to now believe that it's money, of course it might be a mind stretch for you, but go and do some uh, research on what makes money money, and you're going to realize that Bitcoin itself is probably the per most perfect form of money we've ever had. All right, so now just uh, 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 hold that res reservation, uh, reserve that judgment for now, because now I'm going to show you some of the cool things that, it, 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 uh, that it's capable of doing. But let's first try and understand how it works. All right, so I've already said to you that if you understand how a bank works, you know, banks have a database, and in that database there's a ledger, and uh, there's accounts, and those accounts have balances, and uh, uh, every time a transaction happens, the bank receives that transaction, and then they process the transaction, and then they update their ledgers. But the way blockchain works, which is the technology that makes Bitcoin possible, if you always wondered what the difference was, that's the difference. Blockchain is just the tech that makes Bitcoin work. What we have is exactly the same situation as this. We've got a big database with accounts and ledger, uh, ledger of transactions. But what we do is we remove that organization. We remove that authority that is now transacting and, and processing transactions for us. And what we do is we then get a whole bunch of volunteers all around the world and they take an exact copy of that ledger. And now they all end up working together to make sure that the database has integrity and it stays in consensus and it stays synchronized. And this is essentially what the technology was that that Economist article was talking about. That now we can have this bank that isn't run by a bank. There is no organization that's running this bank. It's now this what's called a decentralized bank. That's all it is. It's spread around the world, so it's distributed. And it's decentralized. There's no single authority that's maintaining that. 
So what we have now is this global cloud banking system, if you like, that anybody can go and access. Uh, there's no jurisdiction. If you have money, if you have Bitcoin, there were a few people who have Bitcoin. You don't have Bitcoin in South Africa. You just own a, a, a money or, or numbers that are, are in this big cloud bank. If I move money, if I move a Bitcoin from South Africa to India, I'm not moving anything from South Africa to India. All I'm saying is I own those, that money and now that person owns that money and that person just happens to be somewhere in a different country. Okay. So just in the same way the internet is this big global network that information is moving around on, well now we have this big global internet bank and instead of information moving around it, Bitcoin is moving around it. And again, if you want to now question whether or not that's money, that's up to you. I, 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 go, I urge you to go and look into that. Because I can guarantee you, just in the same way, once upon a time there was one horse, one or two people holding Bitcoin. In a year or two's time, I bet you most of you guys are going to be holding Bitcoin. Okay. So uh, uh, let, let, let's see how that goes. Maybe you can come back to me and, and say that you, you got some. Okay, so now what has that got to do with all this? What's it got to do with smart goods? And what's it, how's it going to help this? How's it going to help the situation? So as I said, I was working in the energy industry. I was at a startup and we were building uh, prepaid uh, uh, vending systems, you know, uh, where people could come and buy a prepaid electricity. Um, and we realized that, you know, there's only a number of uh, uh, payment channels right now. You know, one of our biggest issues was uh, once you move on to a prepaid system is how do you get people to come and buy the electricity? You know, you need vendors and those vendors need to be a ha they have infrastructure and they always increase the costs. Also, you know, if you don't have access to digital banking, you know, you can't go and buy uh, electricity on your internet banking or, or something like that. You're actually going to have to go and make a physical tra cash transaction. So the issue we had was how do we find ways and channels to get people all around this continent to be able to easily make uh, pay, uh, prepaid uh, payments for electricity? Because, you know, in the middle of the night, they run out of electricity. What are they going to do? And so what I uh, was thinking about at that stage is that this Bitcoin technology, the most important thing about it is that you don't need permission to use it. You don't, you know, if you want to create a bank account, you've got to go to the bank, you have to go and give over information, ID, proof of address, and uh, uh, that's a huge barrier to entry. And that's why 80% of Africans are unbanked. Uh, and many, uh, 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 you know, many billions around the world don't have access to banks uh, because of these sort of uh, uh, roadblocks that they have. But with Bitcoin, all you need is a, is, a, is a mobile device. And suddenly you now have access to digital, global digital banking. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be so cool if we could now go and allow our customers to go and buy electricity with Bitcoin? And so uh, what I, uh, I conceived of and what I started developing was this, uh, this, uh, basically this, this, this gateway. Uh, and what, we, what it was, was that it would, to receive Bitcoin, I would get a market rate at the, uh, on the exchange. I would then calculate a tariff and then uh, send a command to that prepaid meter to now remotely load that electricity or to generate a token that they could punch in if it was STS. And I thought, well, this is so cool. You know, this is really going to uh, change the world because now we have uh, another, another payment channel that's really going to be open. Now, just this bit of technology, I'm going to show you now how cool it is because uh, there's a lot of implications around this. Because as I said to you before, if you have a global payment system that has no boundaries and you don't need a, a, a to FICO or anything like that to get into, it really becomes powerful. So I want you to now look at this idea and I'm going to show you a little bit on how we practically apply this and how it made differences to people's lives. And if you aren't thinking in this way, you know, uh, you're, going to, you know, you're going to be left behind because uh, there's not going to be any other payment uh, channel that sort of comes along that fixes the problems, and especially in terms of uh, a cost recovery. So let me, now, let me take you further along this journey and show you what this technology uh, enables. Now you've all heard of the Internet of Things and basically smart meters are Internet of Things. You know, they are connected to the Internet, they are, have sensors, they pick up information and you can send instructions to them. But the most important thing that's been missing out of the Internet of Things is that those devices don't just want to uh, relay information and, uh, uh, and from sensors and all that sort of thing, they also sometimes need payments. And uh, you can't go and, and make a payment to the device itself uh, using traditional means. You're gonna, uh, uh, what we have uh, now is the ability to now uh, have programmatic money that we can now program into the devices themselves. And now these devices can start transacting with each other. I'll give you a, a quick example. You know, there's always a famous example when people talk about Internet of Things. They talk about if your fridge runs out of milk, it can go and buy milk uh, at, the, at the store. But none of us want to give our 
credit card to the fridge, you know, in case it goes on a spree. So uh, uh, what we could now do is we could now allocate Bitcoin, or, or there's another word for those sorts of currencies, cryptocurrencies, you know, small amounts of cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin to these, uh, your fridge, and then it could just have access to that amount of money because it would be programmed into the device itself and then it could actually go and make payments uh, in that way. So you're going to start seeing how now the missing link that's been missing from the whole Internet of Things idea is the fact that now devices are all going to be able to start transacting with each other. Okay, and it's a, excuse me, it's a very interesting idea. Um, so what that makes that possible though, and it's another blockchain related concept, is called something called a smart contract. Okay, so we know about smart grids. Well, a smart contract is basically a little bit of, uh, a little app, let's call it, that has the ability to uh, uh, receive this kind of money, Bitcoin, and then act on it, you know, do something like that. And this is kind of what it looks like. Um, if you were to think about uh, uh, how our meter now would be able to uh, 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 provide energy without having links to some kind of vending system or some kind of uh, uh, organization that's governing that meter, what you could actually do is you could make these devices independent. You know, without having to now report back to some uh, uh, management system that's actually relaying in commands to these devices. You could actually program all the logic that you liked into what's called a smart contract that would sit on a blockchain. And then if money was received on that contract, that contract would then be able to calculate tariffs, maybe pull it from NERSA or whatever, um, and then be able to now load those devices. Suddenly now we can conceive of a world where we have all these devices out there all operating independently and autonomously and able to now manage their own, you know, whatever uh, tasks that they have at hand. Let me give you a practical example of this because obviously this is a little bit technical for probably most of you and a little bit crazy. Let me explain to you now what you could do with this. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a sort of pilot that we've conceived. Uh, uh, maybe this will uh, take off, but obviously, you know, there's always a lot of complications, not technical, you know, regulatory. So imagine a street now where each of these uh, lampposts are now sitting on the street, and uh, the people who are living next to those lampposts can pay now directly to the lamppost to provide light to them. So what they could do, instead of uh, the, the municipality lighting up entire streets that might be very inefficient, maybe nobody's living on those streets, maybe nobody cares for that, those lights, what you can have is a, a, a pay-as-you-go system where uh, do, these devices now are supplying energy based on these tiny microtransaction payments uh, directly from the customers that need, need it. So it's a, a, literally a pay-as-you-go system. Now this would never be possible with the, the financial system that we have today because it's impossible for me to now make a 10 cent, 50 cent, 5 rand, 20 rand transaction to a lamppost. You know, I'm going to have to go through some kind of vending system, some complicated system that takes costs you know, and uh, is inefficient and all those sorts of things. But now with cryptocurrencies and blockchain along with these things called smart contracts, we have the ability to do this, to create this world of shared services that we can now pay directly and those lampposts are managing that directly. So, Quite a, a, a crazy uh, an idea. But let's take that further into this whole idea of microgrids, because I think we were, we were talking about microgrids today, and microgrids are extremely, extremely interesting. You know, in my mind, you know, that's kind of the future, you know, where uh, uh, people can have solar panels on their roofs and not just benefit from it, from it directly, but all that excess capacity, being able to sell it onto their neighbors. And right now, you know, if you wanted to do that, if you had a little microgrid, let's say you had some panels on your roof at home, um, what you would be able to do is, uh, you know, you, maybe you could have uh, links into your house and uh, uh, you could have some deal or arrangement with your neighbors. But let's say, for example, you wanted to provide those solar panels and you wanted to put that system there and you didn't want to have to go and find uh, neighbors that were willing to go along with your scheme, you know, that they would pay you some monthly uh, cost and then you would supply energy directly to them. Well, by using this whole idea of uh, micro contracts in a, in a, in a uh, the smart contracts in a micro grid, um, what we can now do is we could have those panels basically have a contract on there, a little app, and as soon as it receives money from whoever, nobody knows who it's going to be, it will then be able to release energy to whoever's paying them. And again, I can now set the system up, I can uh, uh, configure it so it just receives money, uh, and then whoever is paying it, can, it can then uh, uh, release uh, uh, energy into, into that, into that in, to whoever wants it. Now again, that would be impossible if I had to now accept credit cards or EFTs or something like that. 
But by using cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and these smart contracts, this becomes possible. And this is not even uh, 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 me imagining this, because this exists already. This is something very cool. It's called the Brooklyn Microgrid, and this is what they did. They set up all these uh, solar panels in, in all these places in Brooklyn, and uh, they set up these smart contracts, and then neighbors uh, would just suddenly start, uh, you know, if they wanted to, they could now send cryptocurrency to these panels and receive energy uh, from that, without the owners of those panels even knowing who was drawing that energy from them. So you can see how, you know, and this is just the, the, a, a picture of, of how that would work. So can you see how this is really going to crack open the whole um, idea of being able to have a, a self-sufficient, sustainable little microgrid that you set up and you put the capex into and then allow people to just start uh, 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 purchasing energy from you uh, in, very, in a very efficient manner without having to worry about a financial system that puts the roadblock in, in the way for you to do that. Okay, so um, um, this is, uh, okay, so being able to now accept a, a, a pit Bitcoin for uh, energy, well, that means now you're not restricted to local jurisdictions. You can now receive payments for energy anywhere in the world. Anybody who wants to can now go and send money directly to that meter and they can go and buy energy for that meter without having to use SWIFT or Western Union or anything like that. A very efficient um, method of making payments. So what are the use cases for this? Well, imagine you're a student studying abroad and uh, you run out of electricity. You know, you're going to phone your mom and say, Mom, I need money for electricity. She's going to then wire it to you. It takes several days and at huge cost. Well, now mom can just go and send 50 rand to the meter directly from wherever she is in the world and top up that meter. Now here's another use case, and I want to expand on this use case. Imagine there's a needy school somewhere in Africa, and it has this uh, uh, smart contract prepaid meter. Well, now foreign donors can directly supply energy to that school without having to go through some organization like a charity that will take costs, you know, fees and administration and opaquely distribute the funds. You can directly fund the energy of that school without having to go through an intermediary. And that's going to uh, take me, I know I'm, I'm running out of time here, um, but let me tell you a little, a little story. And this is a story about Emma Wayne Primary down in Soweto. Uh, this is a, you know, I was, I was at many conferences in Europe talking about this technology and uh, 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 what we decided to do was go to this little school called Emma Wayne. Now Emma Wayne is uh, in Soweto, it's like every other little tiny little school, you know, they've got a budget and they can never recover, uh, uh, you know, pay for everything. And so what they do is they stop paying for electricity. You know, this was about three years ago and uh, they had about almost a million rand due on their bill. And so uh, what, what I decided to do was go and set up this little experiment. And uh, what we did was we, we went and installed just a conventional prepaid meter. Um, and, uh, um, and then uh, you know, I sat there and I was like, hmm, okay, you know, now what? You know, I've got this, this smart contract meter. Uh, luckily, I had a friend in Austria who is actually uh, uh, one of the founders of something called the Energy Web Foundation. And they are all about energy and blockchain. It's a whole industry that if you were never aware of, this is, this is where it's going. Um, he was at a, a conference uh, at MIT in Boston. He said, Lorian, why don't you, uh, let's do a live demo. What I will do during the conference is I will send a Bitcoin to that meter in the school and then the delegates at the conference can actually see this instant payment across the world uh, uh, topping up electricity. So um, what he did was we went there and uh, it was about three o'clock in the morning uh, for me, seven o'clock at night for him. I drove down to the school. Uh, the, uh, the, there was uh, no electricity on the meter. The meter had been uh, zeroed out. And I Skyped into the conference and I said, hey, hey guys, here I am. I'm at Emma Wayne. Um, the lights are all dark. It's a tiny little school. It's exactly the same story that I told you. And uh, I told them what would happen. You know, now they can, if they want to, they can now, if they have an emotional attachment and they want to make a difference to this little school's life, they can now go and, and go and top up that energy meter. So this is just me walking around and showing them. And you can see this, this car headlights are on me because it was very dark. Um, and then I just showed them uh, what was going on there. And so then he sent the, the Bitcoin and it took a few seconds and went right around the world. It hit the meter and then uh, the lights went on. But now I was sitting in the dark classroom at the time and behind me, there were all the teachers and the parents had decided to pitch up at three o'clock in the morning in their pajamas and whatnot because they wanted to see what was going to happen. And uh, as soon as the lights went on, they went crazy and uh, uh, the delegates at the uh, uh, conference could suddenly see they had just 
done this. You know, they had just been able to now make a, a difference to this little school, donate electricity. It uh, uh, took a few seconds to get there. The costs were extremely low. Uh, it was about, by the way, it was about seven and a half thousand rand at the time uh, that the, it was sent, and it cost about a rand fifty to get there. So you can just see, uh, how, you know, uh, a, a sort of example of what it is now. As soon as you have this global financial system that's not driven and held by the banking system, and by the way, I work closely with the Reserve Bank. Don't think of me as an anarchist or anything like that. Um, the Reserve Bank are very interested in this technology, um, uh, as are the banks, as you can imagine. Um, this is now going to certainly transform uh, uh, the, the world, let alone your, your world. And has, I hope that those, those examples that I've given you inspire you to be able to think in terms of this. Uh, by the way, that little project that I've got, I've got going on here, this is a Bitcoin address. I know some of you had Bitcoins over here. Um, what we wanted to do was we want to create this kind of, uh, 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 something called Usizo, it means help, uh, uh, where we have this uh, uh, kind of like Kickstarter, we have all these schools around Africa, and then uh, we have this website, and, and, and foreign donors can come to the website, and they can find the school, and they can directly donate electricity to that school. And uh, this is something I'd love to, to get going. In Europe, everyone loves it, uh, but uh, you know, obviously we need support to do that. If any of you uh, would like to be involved in a project like this, uh, uh, please let me know. Uh, I'm sure it, you know, it's going to make a huge a huge impact. But anyway, thank you very much for your time. I think I went a bit over. Uh, if there's any questions, happy to answer.